Hello, and uh, welcome to this virtual session, Consequences, Including Sanctions and Awards. My name is Professor Tom Bennett, and I have the pleasure of sharing my thoughts with you today. So the next 25 minutes, we'll be looking at what do you do after misbehaviour has occurred? What's, what's the appropriate response? What's the effective response? What should teachers do, particularly in the classroom, when it comes to responding to levels of misbehaviour? Now, one of the things I always try to centre I always try to suggest and recommend is that the best school environments are ones in which misbehaviour is less likely because the students have been taught clearly what I would call the behaviour curriculum, the idea of here's what we should be doing. We should feel normal. There should be routines in place where students know what good behaviour looks like, not just bad behaviour. What does good behaviour look like? I think this is a really sensible and really effective way of helping to build a student's habits so they can be successful. We might call that proactive behaviour management thought. Sometimes some, some people would call it pedagogical behaviour management. But that will only take us so far with so many students. Most people in any community need to understand that whatever they do, their actions have got consequences and that they can't just do as they please, even though they may wish to. And all of us do at some point, which isn't to say that we're all selfish, but that we all like to do what we like to do. And some people like to do it more than, more than others. And some people are very conscientious and very empathic and have high regard for other people. And some people are more focused on what it is that they want. This isn't about moral judgment. This is more about practicalities. Most people need to understand that there are boundaries and limits to their behaviour. And boundaries don't exist unless there are some form of consequences to crossing that boundary. Now, the consequences might not always be punitive. And sometimes it's best for them not to be. But students need to see that their actions matter. Because if their actions matter, then they matter. In other words, consequences are a form of feedback that we give to students in order to understand if they're doing the right thing or not. So it's not just about sanctioning students into goodness. You know, that's an absurd notion. What we're trying to do is we're trying to change their future behaviour and we're trying to use consequences as a way to deter uh, students misbehaving in the future. Norms and routines, they're not enough. We can't simply rely on students to do the right thing or be natural saints because they know what the right thing is. And even people who know, for example, how to drive will sometimes drive badly, deliberately um, or impulsively because it suits them in that moment. It would be great if all students were intrinsically motivated to do the right thing. And we obviously we try to work with that too. We try to persuade students to understand how to behave. And I think persuasion is 80% of behaviour management, but it cannot be assumed. And very often, in order to create intrinsic motivation, we need to use some form of extrinsic stimuli or extrinsic motivation, i.e. we have to use consequences. And they teach us that our actions matter. Now, I have to offer a bit of a caveat here. There are dangers of only using consequences too. And some people are worried when we talk about consequences that that's the only thing we're using to try to change or amend or improve a child's behaviour. And they would be right. They, you know, we can't simply use consequences and penalties and so on as a way of making sure that children behave any more than we can guarantee people could be good drivers by heavily penalising them every time they, 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 they break a traffic rule or, or go through a red light. The danger of only using consequences is that essentially you're waiting for people to misbehave before you do anything about it. And that can be quite problematic because that means you're fixing a problem. And also it means that it encourages students and staff to really only think about behaviour when, when it goes wrong, when a rule is being broken. And there's much more to behaviour than simply not breaking rules. And also a third problem is that consequences are very effective with many, many students, but they only work with some students. Or to put it another way, there are some students who are very, very resistant to things like penalties and sanctions and reprimands. It's kind of a bell curve. Some students are very, very motivated by consequences. Some students are not motivated at all, but most people are somewhere in the middle, most people are affected to some extent. Broadly speaking, we might say there are five different types of consequence that teachers tend to use in the classrooms. Encourage, discourage, clarify, support, and teach. And to encourage would be a somewhat behaviorist response. It would be to attach a reward or a desired thing to a desired behavior. Now that could be a, a merit point, a star sticker or a smiley face. Or we might discourage by the opposite process, by using sanctions, by attaching an undesired consequence to an undesirable behaviour. And obviously the, the, the attempt there is to make, make the students think, I don't want to get that undesirable thing, therefore I will avoid the behaviour. It can be seen as a simplistic approach, but it is a very, very effective common 
thing to use as well as other approaches too. Or if a student's misbehaving and it's low level enough, you might want to clarify and redirect. If a student's in the wrong corridor, you can say to them, did you know what you were supposed to do? Or you might see a student who's going slightly off task and you tap the desk and say, Billy, let's get back to work, please. A very simple challenge to a very low level misbehavior and that's a consequence of their action. So we have to get out of this idea that consequences are always punitive. Or there might be support. You know, if a student has missed three weeks worth of work and they're struggling to access the work, which means they're very off task, then part of our response, the consequence of their misbehavior might be to offer some kind of catch up or nurture work. Or there might be a teach, there might be something which is teachable. It might be something that they need to know or be able to do. So for example, if a student has got a literacy issue, Maybe there's a, a much deeper teaching need there in order for them to access curriculums and so on. So there's lots of different things we can do to respond as a consequence to misbehavior. And we have to make sure that we understand there's a broad uh, magazine of things to do. Now I'll talk about sanctions though. Sanctions are very, very useful and they're very, very important because they're something that most schools do. Some schools do them quite badly. Some schools do them very well. And some schools try not to use them at all. This is disastrous. Every successful school community has to have some form of penalty for crossing boundaries. If you don't, then you don't have boundaries, which sounds a bit sad, but for about 5% of children, unless they know that there's going to be some kind of penalty attached to the misbehaviour, they might think to themselves, well, it's, it's worth doing the behaviour, even though I know it's antisocial. Um, sadly, you know, people in general are not natural saints and will often do the wrong thing and will justify it to ourselves. So what are sanctions? Well, number one, it's not retribution. It's not revenge. It's not score settling. You know, we, we don't issue sanctions to get our own back on children or to make ourselves feel better. The desire for either should exclude you from the right to be able to do so. The principal aim of a sanction is to deter. The reason why we have speeding fines and parking fines and so on isn't as a money making well, obviously, you know, opinion varies on that. But but in general, the reason why we have things like that isn't because we're trying to generate revenue. It's because we're trying to get people not to speed and not to park incorrectly. A sanctions aim is to deter. And who are sanctions for? Well, this is something which is often missed. The sanction isn't just for the person receiving the sanction. The benefit of the sanction is also to the community. So a person receiving a sanction will understand and appreciate a little bit more keenly that bad behavior leads to a consequence which can include a sanction. But so too does the community see that this happens. In other words, if you let a student off with a misbehavior because you're in a good mood or you like that student or they're not normally badly behaved, the rest of the community is affected by that and the rest of the community sees that sometimes people don't get penalties for doing the wrong thing, which can create a very broad sense of uncertainty about when and how people receive sanctions. And it reduces the deterrence effect a lot. So it's incredibly important to be as consistent as possible. Some people say, well, do sanctions work? I mean, they work a lot. What they don't do is work perfectly universally. They affect different people differently. And some people are highly motivated to avoid sanctions. They're normally the most conscientious of students. And some people don't care about sanctions whatsoever. And, it's, and there's lots of reasons why. But most people are affected by sanctions to some extent. In other words, most people try to avoid parking double yellow lines because most people don't want to get a parking ticket. Um, so when you say do sanctions work, you can just as easily say do, do sanctions work more broadly in society? And the answer is yes. It's just that they're not perfect. They don't prevent all misbehaviour. Some people still park on double yellow lines. Some people are motivated differently. Some people's brains are wired differently. But they're a very good short-term behaviour modifier. And that's all they are. They're a short-term behaviour modifier, but that's very, very useful. Or to put it another way, if you take away the threat of a sanction, then behavior gets much, much worse. If you see, for example, that WL yellow lines are only a serving suggestion and that there's no penalty for parking on them, we just prefer you not to park there, everybody would park on them eventually because everyone would realize that there's no point in not, and there's no point in avoiding it. There's no penalty. Sanctions in the classroom? Well, people's, all people's need boundaries. They need to know that some behaviors are unacceptable. Otherwise, we're saying to them, it's okay to leave when you feel like it or be racist or misogynist. This clearly isn't the case. So you have to have boundaries. And you have to have boundaries in order for students to feel safe. And if you have boundaries, you need to have penalties. And sanctions enable a community to understand what's forbidden and what's encouraged. So it serves an educational purpose as well. So what about detentions? Well, detentions are probably one of the simplest and most common sanctions you'll see. 
And I mention them simply because they are so simple and straightforward. And also they're quite scalable. You can have short detentions and longer detentions and so on. You can have escalating sanctions and so on. And detentions can take place lots of times throughout the school. It can be after school, before school, during breaks and so on. Um, and teachers can issue detentions as long as they're aged under 18 because the head teacher has got the, the duty and the power to delegate that to people within the school. The schools have to make sure that pupils and parents are aware of sanction systems. And this isn't just a legal requirement, this is a practical requirement, that once people know that there are sanctions and detentions, they feel safer, they understand they exist in a place of structure and safety, and it also will probably help to deter students from misbehaving. So time spent in detentions, this is something which, which, can, be, which can be used in a variable way. So you can put students in detentions for five minutes for a very short uh, misbehavior, or half an hour or an hour or longer or on Saturday morning or whatever, depending on your school behavior policy. And the benefit of this approach is that, as I say, it's scalable. It's, it's an escalating tariff. You can use uh, severe sanctions for severe misbehaviors and smaller sanctions for smaller misbehaviors. You can monitor it. And every school should have a monitoring system. Who's getting it, when and why? That needs to be tracked. So that somebody at some point needs to be looking at the data and saying, what's going on here? Is this student a persistent offender? Are there difficulties here? Is it happening at a particular time? And so on. Now, suspensions and exclusions. This is another way we can deal with, with misbehavior in terms of consequences. Suspensions and exclusions are an essential tool for schools to use, and they must use them when they have to use them. And they shouldn't feel like we failed the student by doing so. If you've done everything you can to avoid suspending and excluding, then you have not failed the student. They are, they are a necessary part of a school's process in order to keep students safe, to create an environment which is calm and predictable and where people are treated with dignity, including, including uh, members of staff. Obviously, we use them as a last resort. And suspensions are usually a way of, of indicating to the student your behaviour is getting very serious and you're at risk of exclusion and also to the parents too. And it's also a way of providing uh, a respite for the rest of the school environment for students who may have been victimized or bullied or abused by the people who received the suspension. So they're an essential tool and they're not a necessary evil. If, it, if it's necessary to do it, then it's not an evil. But as I say, we use them as last resorts. In-school units are often quite useful things. And many schools have got an in-school unit. This will be a small school within a school. This may be a suite of classrooms or a couple of classrooms where students might spend short to midterm um, lengths of time working on their behavior while still receiving a full education. And it's normally used as an intervention rather than a sanction. And it's normally used for students who are at risk of suspension and exclusion. And it's normally used as a way of the students trying to work on how to improve their behavior. It can happen within the school, it can happen in uh, an offsite annex or a third party unit and so on. But in-school units are often a very useful way of acting as a halfway house between the mainstream environment and uh, a suspension or removal to a PRU, for example. And time there is often used to support reintegration into the classroom. And so think about what spaces you have, think about what staff you have, and consider how students get into these spaces, but also how they get out of these spaces. You know, it can't just be a long-term holding pen. It's got to be a program, an intervention, which helps students with their behaviour. Now, inclusion is obviously something we have to matter here, that in order for schools to, be, to meet both the legal and moral requirements of, of their practice, it's vital that students with, for example, SEN um, uh, have reasonable adjustments made for them. And these reasonable adjustments can take lots and lots of different shapes and forms. And it could be something as simple as a, a clip-on tie for a child with autism, or it might be a, a timeout card for a child with anxiety disorder, or a million other things. Schools have got a duty to provide reasonable adjustments and reasonable accommodations for SEN in order to be inclusive as possible. And those adjustments can also apply to things like sanctions and consequences and so on. So it might be, for example, that uh, a child with Tourette's syndrome, 10% of whose sufferers have uh, a kind of a swearing tick. They might be um, exempt from the rule which says you mustn't swear in classrooms. And that would be a reasonable adjustment for somebody depending on their circumstances. What we don't do is make blanket uh, exemptions for students simply because they have some form of SEN. What we don't do is assume that SEN means bad behaviour and bad behaviour means SEN. That To do that reduces the, the, the child's dignity. We target the accommodation to meet the child's need rather than saying you've got an SEN, you can't behave. This is largely 
nonsense. Most children with SEN behaviours can improve their behaviours, can learn coping mechanisms, can learn habits if the school meets them in some shape or form. In terms of consequences, more broadly, you can have exceptions. I've already mentioned a couple, but exceptions must be exceptional. Any rule that doesn't have an exception is usually a cruel rule. And I completely disagree with the, the term zero tolerance. Zero tolerance sounds tough, but it's more of a slogan than a strategy. I don't recommend zero tolerance at all. I recommend very low tolerance of misbehavior. I think that's fine, but you must always have a little bit of wriggle room for children who have got chaotic circumstances, cognitive difficulties, neurological impairments, and other forms of SEN in their lives. If a child is expected to hand in homework with no exemptions whatsoever, including the fact that if a child came in uh, and they, they, their house had burned down that weekend and you didn't give them an exemption for the homework issue, then you would probably be cruel and tyrannical. So zero tolerance is not a good thing to do. You have to have exceptions, but they must be exceptional, they must be logical, and they must be consistent. And how do you use sanctions so that they're the most effective? Well, there's three main factors. They've got to be certain rather than severe. It's the predictability of the sanction that, that creates the power and the impact of it. If somebody knows they're going to get caught and they're going to get a sanction for it, it's far greater a deterrent than thinking I might get away with it even if I am caught. It's a bit like knowing that the speed camera is working. Once you know it's working, it deters you far more greatly. And consistency is key. As much as humanly possible, the same sanctioning processes should operate throughout the school, which usually requires leadership, training staff to meet the same specifications. And we also understand that sanctions affect different people differently, which doesn't mean we don't use them. You know, there are some students who might not turn up for a sanction or a penalty. There are some students that you know they're not going to turn up or they, you, you know they're not going to care about it, but you still set it regardless. Otherwise, you're giving up with them. And you also introduce other, um, other strategies with that student. So you might escalate the sanction or you might introduce a pastoral component to your response or you might exclude or exit the student, uh, uh, suspend it, ex ex or exit the student from the school environment, or they might operate within the inclusion space for a short period of time. There's lots of different things you can do, but what you don't do is just say, oh, well, we're not gonna give penalties because they never turn up. That's how you destroy your system. And why do sanctions affect different people differently? Usually because of very personal reasons. Often people lack the imagination to realize what will happen. They might be impulsive. They might struggle to grasp probability or they understand probability, but they've got a gambling personality. Or they might be so focused on what they're doing that they forget the risks. Or they might not care. Or they might be psychopaths. Or their home environment might be so chaotic they don't care about school environment, and so on. There's lots of reasons why people don't do what we'd like them to do. It doesn't mean they're bad people. What it means is that we still have to we still have to deal with it, um, even if we understand what's going on in the student's life. And severity is really important here. Um, have an escalating tariff. I thoroughly recommend you don't simply have one big sanction for all misbehaviours. Otherwise, it comes across as very unfair. So have an escalating tariff. And if somebody repeats the misbehaviour, they don't get the same tariff again. They get a higher tariff because repeated misbehaviour is compounded. It's got compound interest. As well as having more complex responses. So if somebody is repeating the misbehaviour, you don't just make things tougher for them, or you do that as well but you also introduce a more pastoral approach as well. You have conversations with them. You might meet third party agencies or their parents. You might put them on report. You might try to do some, some behavioral or counseling or therapeutic work with them. But the point is you don't dip, ditch the sanctions entirely. And rewards, rewards actually operate many similar principles to sanctions that we also use rewards to try and encourage and change a pupil's behavior to motivate people and to teach people what the right thing is. And also you might say there's a moral component. You give a reward because sometimes people deserve a reward. They deserve to be recognized. Um, rewards also often have to be highly consistent if they're given publicly. Don't give all your reward points to the worst behaved children, even though it feels like the right thing to do, because otherwise you end up um, with all the worst behaved children getting the attendance certificates and the reward certificates at the end of the year, which creates a very imbalanced value system. Students need to know that they will be recognized for doing the right things. You, what you can do is offer praise to people. Praise is highly, um, is, is a very important thing to use with children because it reaches them as human beings and lets them know that you care about them. The most common rewards are to give people privileges, 
material goods, lollipops, status symbols, you're now the prefect, head of the table, you get to take the every the everywhere bear home, that kind of thing, or just praise. And I would personally say that praise is one of the most important things you can use. High level praise should be saved for special occasions. Low level praise should happen all the time. Because you can cheapen it if you don't. And if you give too much of it, or if you're insincere, or if it's disproportionate, or if you just kind of throw it at the whole class, people don't value it very much. If you flood a market with a commodity, it devalues the value of the commodity. So always think about that. So lots of things to think about there. Lots more to think about beyond this, but this is just a short introduction to some of the things you can think about when using consequences. Used properly, they can be highly effective as a way of reinforcing your whole school or whole classroom behavior system. Thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope you have a fantastic day, whatever you're doing. Take care and goodbye.